Cool. All right. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Um, we're doing a session two of the uh, end of year results uh, survey. And uh, I have a few slides to kind of get this started. Um, does anyone from the, anyone want to say anything before I start? Uh, I know uh, Axel, you spoke up last week. Maybe Gerald, can you say something? Mm, nothing super, super important. I mean, apart from, I think this is a thanking everyone for, for joining um, and, and helping with that. Because I think this, this is one of those opportunities where we can get together um, and it's, it's less individuals who are pushing things, but we, we, we can look into ways where can we drive initiatives together so that it's not just Doug or Adrian or Axel or driving something, but is there some things we can pick and, and put more focus on um, as, as a team or as teams? Cool. Yeah, and I'd like to say something real quick uh, as well. Uh, so I'm sorry that I missed the last one. It overlapped with a, a, a KD Whalen sprint thing, so I didn't get to join. But I'm really happy that we're doing this kind of thing to try to see how we can make, uh, you know, OpenSUSE more well known and, and to grow and become a better community on the ongoing basis. So this is something I'm really happy that we're doing. Excellent. Yeah, so I, I have I'd like to chime in, guys, if I may. Sure. Um, I, I had a thought after last uh, our, our last chat, and there's obviously come up before, but um, in, in terms of OpenSUSE, we sit here as part of the project. Um, and I wonder to what extent we really should be reaching out to what I think of as the community, meaning those guys who are just plain old users. Um, and I think they have a huge part to play and a very symbiotic part to play in the success of the, the whole OpenSUSE, what I would like to call the phenomenon. Um, uh, and what struck me was when we were talking, um, it was just a small group of guys talking about the project. And um, I was thinking there must be thousands of users who don't do anything other than download the distro, run and go. And uh, I, I feel that at some point we really should discuss more about how to bring those guys into the fold or at least get them um, um, some maybe uh, recognition may not be the right word but uh, at least get them enthused about the project in general um, I, I just sense there's some uh, a small disconnect there that's it that's my I'm, I'm gonna get off my soapbox now <laughs> All right, well, th thanks for speaking up. And um, in the chat, I just kind of posted where the slides are, um, if you want to access those. But um, I'll just, I mean, the idea is um, just sort of, I'm going to go over the first few slides to uh, kind of set some expectations, I guess, and um, explain kind of what we're going to uh, go over. Um, so this week, uh, follow on as a follow on to last week, we're going to look at um, tools driving switches to OpenSUSE, uh, tools and uh, reasons why people switch to OpenSUSE. Flagship was mentioned in discussion. We can go over and talk about this and, and, and see um, how we want to view um, the multiple distributions and the other projects that we have within OpenSUSE and like how we might consider marketing that. Um, and then I have improved demographics and expanding global users. And that, that's, uh, they're sort of like lumped together in the slides. Um, but uh, there's a there's a difference there into in both of those. And I also had a few uh, things that I looked at before we started the um, meetup. 
um, that would go over uh, some just some more informative um, analytics uh, that I grabbed from the website. So um, for today, and just the same as last week, you know, these are sort of the ideas and say ground rules or whatever um, that we want to want to have here. So just everyone, you know, you're a part of this as well. You could you could just sit simply listen the whole time or you can provide input. Um, and we hope to put those um, ideas into action um, to, to better improve the project and just, you know, we can consider it respectful of one another's opinions. And um, yeah, that's all I want to say with that. So we can go into um, into switchers, and when we go into switchers, um, this was talked about. Uh, Adrian, speak up if if you want a little bit more to expand on that. But it was a topic that was brought up where, if you look at um, our people that are using um, using Linux, it's you know we're looking at a good portion um, that are over the 10 years, but if you look at uh, about 40% really are under five years. So um, that's a significant portion. And we, we would want to, I believe, grow that and make those sort of more compatible. It's great that we have the, the you know, that we have the 10 year plus people, um, but obviously that's, um, you know, we want to grow those other areas. Um, because those people that are in the tenure, I mean, they're 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 already sold. They're going to be using it. Um, they're comfortable with it. And then um, with uh, switching of servers, um, you know, we 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 see most are coming from other Linux distributions, um, and you know, maybe a quarter right are coming from Windows. But uh, it, it is. Um, it is an interesting factor when you see that transition sort of the next slide, I kind of break down uh, what are the, uh, what are the distributions where, where they're coming from. I think we, I'm not sure if I showed this last week or not, but um, Ubuntu is, is the biggest there. Um, I did. And I basically I took the comments section. There was a, a um, an option to do that uh, from the, uh, or from the from that the, question that question so you really so, counted all the the different uh, answers for that particular one yeah i mean there were only two that i could um but the, these ones i yes with this i ended up doing like a tablet and um yeah so most are coming from ubuntu but we could probably expect that since that's usually an entry point into linux for a lot of people um, which my, my personal feelings about this are that, um, you know, we, we've long felt that, um, you know, competing with Ubuntu is not necessarily something we, we had wanted to do. And we said, well, let, you know, they'll find, I mean, they'll find us, right. Um, or they'll eventually move on or expand or whatever, or, you know, they'll, they'll go to a different distribution. But you'll get a lot of entry point people, I think, using Ubuntu. Anyone have any comments or? Yeah, I, um, I think this is. So I think this is actually um, sort of an indicator that if we did actually put a slight bit more focus on on being accessible at the entry point for for people to Linux in the first place we would be a lot more successful because if by a fair margin, the majority of switchers are coming from Ubuntu, then, and, and the assumption being that they're semi-satisfied here, then that means that this is saying that if we did a little bit more to cater to the same kind of market that Ubuntu does, there's there's a whole there's just a minor jump there that can be skipped and people can come just straight to us so like i feel like that what that says is that we should 
think about where people choose Ubuntu and what what are our weaknesses to make us better in that respect. Anyone else want to comment on about that? Oh, by the way, um, so I just posted the Etherpad, so we could probably everyone can kind of collectively put in minutes there. Um, and comments. Well, if 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 I understand this correctly, there could be a different way, and that is focus on some other areas then then where ubuntu is strong or ubuntu is winning well, i mean the decisive factor that will adjudicate between your inter interpretation gerald and uh, niels is how much time people have spent on ubuntu mm. if they have spent a lot of time that means uh, it's rather your interpretation, and if they have spent little time and they they are still they still qualify as new users, then it's rather Neil's interpretation. So, as far as I'm concerned, I think both interpretations is actually um, uh, they're, they're compatible in the sense that we can uh, cater for both groups of users simultaneously, provided we provided we, we don't fail with basic stuff such as discovery of the images, installation process, documentation. So I think, I think we don't need to totally diverge in terms of strategy, just depending on whether we agree with one or the other interpretation. It, and I would just say from a marketing perspective, um, it's rather difficult because Ubuntu does get a lot of love, particularly from media in general. Um, why that is versus all these other distributions that are out there, I mean, that's kind of hard to uh, identify, but um, they very clearly get a lot of attention regardless. And at any point in which they do something, um, they get attention and people write about it. And I, I know having um, spoken with a few people that work at had worked at Ubuntu, you know, they were really their effectiveness was effectiveness really was that Mark pushed them to blog, and which we know from last week, you know, blogging is going to get more attention. So um, that is an area where we could potentially place focus on um, just having more people in the community blog about. Open Susan, what they might be doing, or what's new, or something to that effect. Yeah, I mean, the the one of the one of the challenges, like uh, that, I've personally had advocating for Open Susa over the past five years that I've been part of the project, is that I don't know what I can talk about to bring up Open Susa reasonably in conversation with people because. Uh, saying the same thing over and over again bores people. And so being able to have something fresh to discuss, basically every time that there's a potential avenue to talk about Obtusa makes it a lot easier to to bring, uh, to, to boost OpenSUSE's mindshare. Uh, this is the same strategy I've often used when talking about Fedora when I'm working in the context of the Fedora project. And I think that that's been very successful being able to have something to talk about all the time that that shows that there is something going on in the OpenSUSE project. I mean, I think the two flow. Oh, sorry, you go ahead. Go ahead. First. No, please, please. I'm just typing. So go ahead. Okay. Um, the, the, the two flavors of of user here and I, uh, we I think we lose ground in two different areas um, if I can talk about the sort of um, if you, for with without sounding condescending that the higher area um, whenever you try and spin up a VPS or you want to start a project or something and you go to a provider everybody's got Ubuntu um, most people have CentOS. 
Um, and finding people with SUSE is uh, open SUSE is actually quite difficult. And then when you do find someone, finding someone who's got a distribution that you can just click and run, um, uh, that's not one or two generations old. The, the vast majority of places, uh, well, not, I don't know about the vast majority, but a lot of places still offering OpenSUSE 15.1. Um, some of them are even offering uh, the old sort of, um, uh, um, you know, 11 or something stupid like that. Um, so that's that's one side of thing, uh, one side of uh, the game, if you like, that if we can reach out to the um, to the the server vendors, as it were, to make it make it a viable or, or not viable, but a more popular distro to put out there. That would deal with the sort of uh, the developers and the admins and those sorts of people. The other side of it, I think, comes down to the people who want to want to try it out. Um, and that's going to be really quite hard, I think, because you know, the mindset is all Ubuntu. Anything, uh, you know, the, the first tool that anybody does, uh, uses, is Google. So if you say, Google, I want to try Linux, uh, it's going to come back with Ubuntu. So mm. somehow um, uh, we've got to be more present there. And blogging obviously works because it, it, it gets more Google results. But I do think we should look at this as a two-pronged approach, uh, one being on the server side and the other one being on the, the new user, the desktop replacement side of things. Um, those are my thoughts on that. Well, with the, the, on the first prong that you mentioned with you know, having it on servers and, and VPSs and stuff, I actually I completely agree with it. I, I think that the lack of availability of OpenSUSE in virtually everywhere, uh, I think offhand I only know of two places where I can actually get OpenSUSE for server. Um, but also um, there's a stunning lack of confidence in OpenSUSE on the desktop as well, which is um, incongruent with how well OpenSUSE itself does work on the desktop. Uh, and ever since what mid last year or something like that, uh, where Linux distributions have been showing up on computers, people have been asking over and over again, why, why aren't we there? And that's a, that's a, um, it's a difficult thing to solve. I don't, I don't know what, what we can do there without relationships that we don't have right now. I mean, is it possible for somebody to like reach out to Lenovo? You know, the, I know that you know, Neil, the Fedora team, you you helped work with that, um, getting Fedora onto their machines, OEM. Were, were you were you not a part of that, or at least I, know, people who were part I of was that? I was part of the some of the bring up work, but the initial contact was done through Red Hat and Lenovo, uh, Red Hat's desktop team and Lenovo Engineering. Um, okay, but I helped I helped a little bit with the actual work to make it possible. But I wasn't part of the I wasn't part of the initial relationship starting. Um, alas, I don't really have contacts in in that particular space to make something like that happen. I, I mean, obviously, you know the the code has been broken by somebody, and and there's interest already in OEM manufacturers. So I, I wonder. I mean, it's got to be a lot easier to add OpenSUSE than it would be to add Linux. I would think. And yeah. we're talking about as a as a product, Leap is flipping awesome. I mean, right right now it is it is such a good product. I I at this point I have no problem pushing someone toward Leap, um, for for a, a desktop usage. And so I, I don't see what the, I guess I, I kind of don't see. It's not a hard sell because it is a good product. Well, it it's is not about selling it. It's about relationships and. At least from within the context of the OpenSUSE project, I know of basically nobody with any relationships with major OEMs. I know that SUSE, for historical reasons, has a relationship with Hewlett Packard and Hewlett Packard Enterprise, but 
that doesn't help me or anyone else in the OpenSUSE project. Yeah, right. so there's two factors. One is it's actually more work than you would think. Um, SUSE has been has been doing that among others with HP, um, doing desktop preloads, notebook preloads, and and. and we're not talking about a couple of hours of a couple of volunteers per week. This is this is really significant. Um, and the other the other element that I'm seeing is in most cases, most hardware vendors or cloud service providers for most use cases are very happy to just have two Linux vendors. Um, so for example, I don't think Lenovo and it's actually been tried um, by some colleagues. I don't think Lenovo is very realistic because there is Ubuntu, as we discussed earlier, and there is this specific ongoing relationship with, with Fedora. So adding, I, you're totally right in terms of drivers and, and other infrastructure. Um, it's a lot easier when Linux as such is already enabled, but, but still the the interest of adding more and more variety there is cost associated with that for for those vendors and so the primary reason they would do that if is if there is demand and all, and that's where the snake bites its tail obviously yeah um, but, um so and then, and that's basically why i i didn't want to focus too as Gerald said, that's pretty much the reason why I didn't want to focus too hard on on Lenovo as a specific option because the dual vendor thing is the dual supplier thing is basically most OEMs limit uh, right now. Uh, it, right now, I honestly, if we were to do this, if we were going to try to do this, Hewlett Packard would be our best shot because they're not doing anything right now with with Linux and and it is an option and a way to be kind of competitive um but i don't have a relationship with them i don't know anybody at hewlett packard and that makes that extremely difficult to us to even start that conversation you know there's another point too where attila kind of mentions there is like digital ocean right we've been trying for years to get this um to, to get OpenSUSE on that. And I mean, Linode's been, you know, we've worked with them, they're, they're great. Um, they're, they're really, you know, they've been around for a long time and they're, they, they know where the uh, audience is in the, in the community, you know? So, um, but yeah, some of these, um, some of, some people just, some companies really just don't necessarily play along or it's not in their interest. Um, but the only way we can change that is by trying to be vocal, um, or come up with some plan that we can all kind of agree and, um, yeah. The, the, the strongest lever would be, um, demand, you know, if say school districts were to were to start purchases purchasing notebooks and they would be asking for open source or or companies or whatever and that's obviously not easy to get but that's the from my work with vendors that's the argument that's always the most convincing yeah i mean that's how fedora wound up being on laptops was uh, on Lenovo laptops and other vendor laptops is that their customers kept asking for it. So um, at, at some point, uh, one of the Lenovo folks working in, in the Linux, uh, in the, in the Linux laptop division that was handling rel and whatnot uh, was actually became, was a member of the Fedora community. And when the request started coming in, they were able to pivot to actually make it happen. Uh, and that's that's sort of how that started. Um, I don't know if that is actually an av I don't know if that would that kind of uh, happy coincidence would happen in 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 our world. But as Gerald said, like adding demand and adding interest 
can make a whole lot of other things start magically happening. Um, because people who are motivated and interested and and want to drive the success of the of the community and the platform will just sort of make things happen as it goes along. And so I think that that is something that's going to be one of those midterm kind of things that will resolve itself over time. We do have a big mindset issue to overcome. Um, just uh, going back to my own experiences, I had quite a difficult conversation with um, um, with, with with my son, who, for his sins, has followed me, his father into the industry, and um, the organization he works for um first of all gave him he, he he administers linux systems but they wouldn't let him have a linux workstation which is mental um he then kicked up a load of fuss about it and um the organization that he works for uh basically said to him you you can't because we have to have a certified system for whatever reason and they seem to think that Windows was certified and Linux wasn't uh, despite the fact that um, uh, you know they were using predominantly Linux servers in uh, on, on the uh, on their back end but then what tends to happen is you get people in HR or petty managers or administrators who don't really understand this after kicking up a lot of fuss, um, he was allowed to get Linux, but they insisted that he used Red Hat uh, because they they knew that it was certified, uh, and and you know it it just became so hard that in the end he basically just ran. Uh, he, he just ran his. Uh, he just ran a VM inside whatever they gave him. Um, so the, the, there are some real obstacles there. Um, and that, I, I don't know how to, don't know how to get over that. That particular obstacle that you mentioned would actually be easier for us to solve than all the other ones we've been talking about, because uh, we can say things that you know, because of the relationship between OpenSUSE Leap and SUSE Linux Enterprise, that, that can make those kinds of enterprises more comfortable with it. That being said, uh, we don't have any marketing right now built around that. And that's something that we're going to have to start figuring out as we ramp up um, OpenSUSE Leap 15.3. Um, so, so that is something to keep in mind for those, for those specific use cases. Yeah, one thing um, on this whole uh, coming back, I, I, we're switching here from, if you like, from the the, the back back office to front office again. Um, the there is the perception between tumbleweed and leap. I think uh, there is a perception that tumbleweed is uh, particularly, you know, for geeks, versus leap is your go-to platform now. Uh, I'll put my hand up here is I don't run tumbleweed at all uh, because um, I, I, I really don't like surprises in what I do uh, <laughs> because I, I my entire production runs on OpenSUSE. Absolutely. But the issue with Leap being so closely tied with Sleep is that there is there there are a lot of program versions on the desktop that are compared to uh, if you one would say compared to Ubuntu and people are absolutely antique. Um, a really good example of that was one that I had to deal with today, uh, which was uh, a Nextcloud desktop, and um, the version. The version available through Zipper is um, actually probably well over a year old. 
um, which is a lifetime <laughs> in, in, in this game. Uh, so I, I don't know how... I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry? <laughs> Thought you so, were done. Continue, please. Uh, well, I, I basically, you know, plan B, flat pack, bang, done. Uh, oh, sorry, app image uh, in that particular case. But uh, I use an awful lot of app images and flat pack Im uh, images uh, where, where the same programs are available in Zipper, uh, simply because the Zipper versions are a little bit too intolerably out of date, at least for Leap. I'm done. <laughs> so, yeah, that... maybe what we should stress a little bit more is the long-term support character of Leap. Right. Uh, what what that that is it basically? I mean, other like Fedora or Ubuntu, they are doing half yearly releases of new uh, distributions, whereas we are doing it just on a on an annual basis, basically. And, and this gives, uh, yeah, the, the long-term stability. And given the fact that SLE itself is a kind of long-term support thing, I mean, they're supporting, I think, Leap 15 until 2028 or something like that. I, I don't have the, the, the exact schedule in mind. But we should really stress Leap is the long-term support version. And if you want to really have up-to-date software, go the tumbleweed way. I mean, I, I completely agree with Arias. Um, I have one system, uh, a desktop over here running with Leap 15.2, and you can't use uh, Kmail on that uh, because it, there is a bug in it that sucks up all the, the CPU power and it's not ending uh, with, with downloading the IMAP servers and something like that. It is a known bug, but nobody has a, has a resolution for it so far. So I think, I think that's true. Um, so I, th I think, you know, the currency of some packages is, is certainly a question. Funny enough, None of those two that you mentioned, um, Nextcloud and KDE, Kmail, are part of SUSE Linux Enterprise. So the reason they are older, or if, if they and probably many others are older in Leap, that has nothing to do with SUSE Linux Enterprise, but just how we as OpenSUSE add things on, on top. So that means there is an opportunity for us to change how we go about such things. Right, I was, I was actually gonna say the same thing because uh, most people who complain about Leap software, even in, in the OpenSUSE Discord, they're not using the GNOME desktop. Basically, uh, very few people recommend the GNOME desktop for various reasons. And so the out-of-dateness of Leap on, on on for KDE or any of the other community desktops and any of the software built on that is purely a question of whether or not uh, we want to suffer through our own um, update process to to push them out. I know that from my perspective, I maintain some software in Leap, and I I don't like updating software in Leap because the process is too painful. Um, this is something we should probably take a closer look at and, and try to improve because that could have very nice effects for uh, for Leap users and make it a lot more attractive as a platform. Um, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I have a couple of packages that I maintain uh, myself and had some various discussions with the maintenance team why a version bump certain packages was justified or was not justified and in general the maintenance team really focuses on the stability and they're not really happy to have a version bump inside uh, uh, in, in, inside one release right maybe this is something that we that we need to discuss within the open source community um, my opinion is a little different because I think we already have a lot of um, uh, tricks or uh, things that other distro haven't. 
uh, such as uh, BitClear, FS and Snapshot is a standard for us. Um, other distro haven't uh, this way to make uh, much more security. Um, in my opinion, uh, I would like to uh, try to make something similar uh, marketing. I don't know if it's uh, real marketing. All of us have to make uh, um, little video or um, open a single uh, blog or explain in um, uh, um, our community how is simple to use um, in a specific way. For example, I'm an I'm expert of multimedia. I explain in my community how is simple to set up OpenSUSE for multimedia. If um, another user is um, expert for IT, I explain how to use uh, OpenSUSE uh, for IT and is simple. If we uh, can have a collect of this information and make a lot of um, information inside the uh, web, I think uh, when uh, we try to search something, uh, security Linux inside Google, Wow, we can uh, 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 find uh, OpenSUSE uh, in the third position. Wow, it's my idea to make a bit um, more information about OpenSUSE because we have a lot of things. I'm not uh, um, to think. I'm not think what we have because we have a lot of good things and this. Uh, um, a good way to explain because I use or we are using OpenSUSE. Um, so I guess we can kind of probably move into the, the flagship discussion. We're kind of already in it in a sense, but um, I just kind of want to show a few more a little bit more information on there. So here we have um, we have a sort of the leap use, and um, you know a lot of people don't seem to be touched. I mean, well, I'd say it's interesting that the number of people that touch it on a regular basis is is not split kind of in half, and then when we go to tumbleweed you'll see that there's a lot more people using it um and so with that you end up uh in discussion well, where where should we put the focus you know um uh, it's you know do we look at the, the desktop environment do we look at the server aspects um these are all sort of points that I think we should we should try to well write down or get get down so that we we're all kind of in the same page of what we're trying to do here. Well, in 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 terms of flagships, uh, the main talking point that I've I've historically used when talking about OpenSUSE uh, is that. OpenSUSE Tumbleweed is the rolling release with a safety net. And that's quite special because I don't know of any other rolling release distribution where if it blows up in your face in an update or if you've done something wrong in your configuration or whatever, that you have a way to recover uh, barring something stupid like a hardware fault. Uh, we don't promote this aspect of OpenSUSE very much. And if I feel like if we did, if we talked about this aspect a little bit more, we could really make the point that we could have something, something approaching a stable, trustable rolling release platform, something that you know takes on all the good parts of what people consider to be good about Arch and other similar rolling releases, 
and removing the bad parts. We have a tested platform. It gets validated. We don't release snapshots unless it, it has some basic level of working nature. We don't we have a way for people to go backwards and forwards. Like this is this is something that basically nobody else has, and that makes Tumbleweed very special. On the flip side, if we were to get more commercial arrangements that make uh, Leap more omnipresent, uh, then then it, then it becomes a more interesting conversation of whether we should flip the flagship from Tumbleweed to Leap, uh, because the availability of Leap would be higher. Um, as things currently stand, my 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 gut feeling says that we probably want to remain considering Tumbleweed as our flagship because it has more differentiators than than the other Linux distributions on the market, and that is, I think, rather important for us to be somewhat successful in growing our community. Can you list some of those differentiators that are in your mind? Or actually, anyone, um, you know, that would be, you know, that could be an article in itself on the differentiators uh, and even maybe gear or engage with some other people in the media who might be willing to talk about the differentiators between Tumbleweed and the other um, rolling releases. Sure. Uh, may I just ask a quick question here, and I'm asking it purely out of my ignorance because it's relevant to some of the thoughts that are going in through my mind. Um, does does butter file system run on a looks vol uh, volume? It does, but the configuration is a super obtuse. Um, okay. Up until extremely From recently configuring such a thing through Yast has been kind of painful. Um, but it should be relatively easy now as of Leap 15 too. So. Okay. Um, again, just jumping in with one of my own experiences that, that why I'm in, 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 in Leap and not on Tumbleweed on my desktop is I did run Tumbleweed for a time, uh, but uh, because of the difficulties, um, I was running on EXT4, and then something did go wrong, and I had no rewind button, and it was so painful. It was it was basically a complete reinstall uh, from scratch, and um, sort of reverting back to the safety net, uh, and off going to leap, which is why I'm back on leap. So. This this may be some uh, something that 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 we need to think about making easier, because increasingly in this day and age, people do want an encrypted file system. Yeah, and there's also things going on uh, in ButterFS upstream, um, mostly driven by uh, conversations I've had with ButterFS developers um, in the Fedora Workstation Working Group of having ButterFS get native support for encryption, including being able to do blind backups, blind encrypted backups using ButterFS send and receive. Um, blind meaning that you don't need the key to, you don't need to decrypt anything to transfer the, 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 the at rest data. The at rest data can be transferred encrypted. Um, that is something that once that lands in the next four to six months um, will be very interesting for us to start looking at pulling in and 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 building solutions around it to make that case a lot easier. But yeah, if you want to have most of the benefits of Tumbleweed without any of the pitfalls, you kind of need to be using ButterFS. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I, I hear you, but I think what you're saying is down the line, once ButterFS can 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 do native encryption, 
um, then are we in a position whereby we can really put tumbleweed right at the forefront and um, sort of almost make tumbleweed our desktop solution and uh, leap as the uh, server solution? We would need some desktop engineering to be able to integrate the new feature because right now everything only knows Lux. But yeah, possibly. Andreas, you, that, I, I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, not directly related to Lux, but uh, in general, if we really want to have people using Tumbleweed on the desktop, I can share that um, I've been adopting Tumbleweed for half a year now, previously using Leap. And uh, one of the things that I think we may need better solutions for is that, you know, uh, Tumbleweed brings way more frequent and sometimes relevant updates to the system. But uh, when I really use my system as a desktop, then I have tons of console windows open. I have dozens of you know browser tabs open. I have like five email drafts open at a time, and that is kind of counterproductive for actually you know um, rebooting the system, because at most I can restore the you know Firefox tabs back to what they were previously. So that would be an idea yeah, that, that we may want to think about how to improve. Um, if we really want to promote Tumbleweed as the main desktop for more people? Well, there are, I'm, I'm not going to go too deep into this, but there are two technical strategies to solve this. The first technical strategy option is to basically start forcing offline updates and, and scheduling them rather than having pe tell people to use, you know, zippered up and then have uh, right away on the console. Like, make sure that they use the right path through the graphical interface. Um, the second strategy is we change basically everything so that updates and stuff don't apply to the running system. And if you continually do updates or installs or whatever, you have to reboot for them to take effect, which is the transactional update, mo transactional update model. I don't know which strategy we want to go for. The first one is actually probably easier to do. Um, from a from a user experience perspective, but the second one is something that there is a subset of the OpenSUSE community who's quite interested in. I believe that's going on with the micro OS desktop work, but there there I'm are ways. Of those two paths, but neither of them is a solution to what I was raising. Yeah, there is no because solution in the end, raise. at some point, you will need to do a reboot in order to have the new kernel. Or other kernel there is kernels. no solution for what you're asking for. There are only paths in which we can make that less painful. We cannot make updates work live. Full stop. I suppose they're completely different use cases. Um, in in I, for example, for most people, they're likely to do a complete shutdown once a day or so. Um, so that wouldn't be a a, a problem that you do your reboot at the end of the day. Um, but if you have people that have their desktop going all the time, then that's a completely different use case. So perhaps that's just something we need to make people aware of. Yeah. Uh, the the two-pronged approach basically is we've got to figure out, you know, how do we how do we communicate this to users? Because you know when we made this change in Fedora um, five years ago, where we changed all of our graphical tooling to prefer offline updates. Um, there was a subset of people who screamed, but it also changed it. That change made open made Fedora look a lot more stable because we didn't wind up in inconsistent states all the time. And people gained that expectation of if we're doing an update, make sure we've got our work saved and plan for it and that sort of thing. And there's things like scheduled updates um, and that sort of thing in the same vein that like Windows and Mac OS both do. And that's, I think that's a more solid approach for the vast majority of desktop users than trying to, you know, you know, climb up that mountain, push a rock up a mountain to, uh, to make live updates work without breaking the desktop. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, if you look at most uh, operating systems around, they pretty much behave this way, where uh, whenever you make a major uh, update to the system, 
you are expected to eventually restart it or have it have it uh, happening offline. So um, I think uh, for what I understood, we already do offline updates, uh, at least for GNOME and KDE, as far as I know. And uh, for Tumbleweed, I think that's probably the way the way forward for all for for, for all uh, desktop environments, at least for desktop users. And they, they will probably have to adapt to that that new way of updating. Offline updates are currently disabled in GNOME software and Discover because the zipper backend is broken for this. Uh, okay, I, I was not aware. <laughs> it used to work not long ago. Okay. No uh, it kind of works in Leap, but then SUSE, for some reason, made the decision to turn off the feature in Package Kit, so it's just okay. straight up disabled everywhere. Okay. Well, we just uh, do a... reg regardless, I think we should probably get that working because I agree that offline updates are probably the, the safer way to update the system anyway. Does Does anybody know what percentage of of the distributions actually use GNOME or have any idea? Uh, I don't have firm statistics, but we, we do um, have we do have statistics though. <laughs> we I don't have firm statistics on a global basis. We have statistics for within OpenSUSE. No. I'm talking about OpenSUSE. Oh, okay. Well then, in OpenSUSE. I think it's like mo uh, I don't know what the exact KDE numbers are. I think it's like sixty. Yeah. I think it's like sixty percent KDE, and then the rest is split. Okay. Well, I must admit, I'm I'm a KDE, and one of the big reasons for coming to OpenSUSE was was KDE. Um, so that that's interesting. It's what we're known should for. We, well, should we should we really be looking at GNOME as a serious option or as an also ran type of desktop if you really need it? We don't should really have a choice. We don't really have a choice about not supporting GNOME as a flagship yeah. because SUSE made their bed and they lie in it now. Uh, really, it's Novell's fault. But like, they've been doing GNOME for their desktop for almost 10 years now. So we don't really have a choice in that matter. We kind of need to make sure it's supported as a flagship because otherwise we have a huge discontinuity between SUSE Linux and OpenSUSE Linux. Exactly. That's, that's exactly the point. I think GNOME is the, in terms of enterprise, is the desktop environment of choice for most distributions. So not having it supporting open source. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I guess so not having it supporting open source would probably not play well with uh, what we are trying to achieve to bring uh, uh, SUSE Linux and uh, open source uh, distributions together. Basically. Um, I could. Could we maybe move on? Um, I yes, please. please. Can we yeah. can we move on? Okay, <laughs> great. I didn't, want to speak. I didn't want this to last so long. Um, so the next the next thing that I wanted to kind of go into was the uh, was sort of the uh, global use and demographics, and um, I have a few slides to bring out some information that you might find interesting, dealing with the results, but also like what we've. Uh, yeah, let me refresh that, and it worked the last time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the breakdown here, um, you can see this is this is again this is just purely results so um you know while a survey is good it it only is as good as like the people that participate right um but it should it should give us a, uh, some good ideas um and overall uh we see that primarily or a lot of the um people that are using it or sorry, the people that responded are, are, are primarily from Europe. Uh, age was also an interesting um, thing. Um, I mentioned in the articles kind of like focusing on um, 
trying to increase knowledge between um, in ages below 35. Um, just because it's, you know, the growing, well, we, we need to replace, to, have, to be sustainable, we need to look at uh, replacing um, the people that um, are going to fill the gap, so to speak, when, when we get older, um, or some of us who are already old. Um, so... I wanted to point that out. I, I don't know how we do it. Uh, you know, it, it goes down to marketing, but also goes down to some social media and other things like being in spots where perhaps we're just uh, not seeing. I don't know if TikTok's a great example of that, but, you know, people are starting to look at that. Um, there's also a new app called uh, Crowdhouse that I, or uh, sorry, Clubhouse that's out there and, I've um, brought some emails about uh, brought up some emails about getting some people to have discussions on there if they are interested. Um, with the about Candy Crush, there. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's an it's a really interesting app. Is people they just discuss things, and um, I I could see it as a potential um, a potential opportunity for us. In, in the, I mean, not just OpenSUSE, but like in the, in the Linux open source world, because I, they, they're already having conversations about uh, open source. It's just, uh, they term, um, when they're discussing it, they're discussing it like uh, uh, as an entrepreneur type of aspect. So, but in, interesting, if you, if you wanna hear more about it, uh, just email me or something we can we can discuss it um so yeah the gender breakdown um we had a significant amount of people that did not um did not um uh, respond um the non-binary was a little bit higher than the um linux um survey that they did and then the female category was a little bit under um, what uh, Linux, uh, the Linux Foundation survey was. Actually, if you have such comparative data, it would be interesting to put that in the slides in some form. Yeah. It, see if I also could. Also, like, you know, for the geographic or, you know, or what other, you know. Well, the G, see, and that's what I'm going to get into. I didn't, I don't have, um, I mean, the, 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 the um, Linux one is, um, uh, the Linux um, survey is online, but uh, yeah, I could I could do that next time. But anyway. another aspect, of course, is you know if we repeat this survey, it would be good to actually track you know like how did it change from the last survey to the current one. Plus minus things, yeah. yeah That's a good comment there. And I would really like to add uh, not just the geographical region, but maybe the selection by country. Quite interesting as well. Um, so I'll, I'll just let you know that there's a with Lime survey there is a bug that is not worked out. <laughs> so I've tried to do it. Um, I what we our original intent was to do that. Unfortunately, it didn't really uh, work out because it wouldn't accept it. Oh, okay. From programming point, but, but um, let me. Andreas's point of um, having comparatives year year over year comparatives. So that probably what you're getting at there, Andreas. Yeah, just basically, um, you know, identifying trends and differences. To you know, for right now it's just absolute numbers, and you know, we don't know. You know, does Fedora, you know, maybe have the same male dominated number? Are we better or less than Fubar? Mm -hmm. and so on so yeah um so I, I did extract a little bit of that um with some images here that i did um right before um right before we had the meeting and i put these in there um so you can see this is a month this is strictly a month and actually it's only 
really two weeks because um, uh, the the what used to be called PWIC, which is uh, Matsumo, uh, was was down due to a power outage, and we have that back up. And so um, it didn't have the data from before, and so we're basically looking at two weeks. But this is software.opensuse.org, so we know like it, what's interesting every every nation with the exception of South Sudan is on there. Um, oh, uh, and Etrer is not there either. Um, the one right above, uh, I think that's Ethiopia, or right on the side of Ethiopia. Um, but overall, you can see by the color um, what the um, what the actual use because if people are on software right they're pro more than likely they're using it um so with that the overall look um primarily the numbers as i as i went down um were germany was was first uh followed by the us followed by brazil russia china india and um then you can kind of go into um, each of the countries themselves and, and see what else is, is higher. But that, so that's just people that in the past month we know have used it. What is. So is oh, that, I'm sorry, is that just, you know, um, viewing the web page or actually downloading things from there? That is downloading some package. Okay, whether, cool. whether it be. Um, whether it be the actual um, installation media or, um, you know, Chromium. Yep. It, it's, it covers that. Um, and then that's just opensusa.org. Um, so again, overall, uh, it's, it's very nice to see that. Um, when I get into the the wiki and put a slightly different, um, well, actually not, not that much different. Um, but the numbers were, I believe it looked like they were less and they should actually, cause if, if you look at the other maps, they were, uh, the colors were a bit more strong and then, um, forms very similar look. Well, actually the interesting thing here is that Germany and the U S appear to be inverted now. Yeah, that's true, huh? Yeah, good point. And China looks, actually, that was right. When I looked at that, China also was an interesting thing because they were, I think they were third on that, and it was a pretty high number. It was like 7,000, 7, 8,000. Uh, so it kind of stood out there. Which I think but, is an interesting social data point that people communicate differently or with, in, in different, well, not differently, with different tools um, depending on like region. Yeah. It would be interesting to, I know we can't really do it, but the, the emailing, it would be interesting to see where, how the email looks. Mm -hmm. um, because it's occasionally come up that, you know, people from the forums are actually, you know, reaching out either on RSC channel or um, on, on mailing list and saying, hey, there's someone here that has a question that hasn't been answered is because, you know, like some of the really geeky experts are rather on the mailing list and not on the forums answering those questions. Yeah. So. Um, oops, sorry. There does become a limit as to how many streams anybody can follow, uh, you know, with the mailing lists or the forums. Uh, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's one of the things I think we touched on last week, which is if we can narrow down these channels so that somehow um, it, it becomes easier to, to find, uh, get answers to things or... And you can, uh, at the moment, I think we've got 
groups in Discord, Telegram, uh, and it, uh, the mailing lists, and it goes on and on and on. There's only that many hours in the day that anybody could follow all of this. Yeah. Um, is these, these are, again, you know, I listed questions just to sort of uh, spark some conversation to see, like, or dialogues to see, like, how we can extract some of these these things. And, and, and what with uh, those the graphics that I was showing, um, you know, that how, how do we how do we uh, increase usage in other parts of the globe? I mean, uh, South America is actually quite big for us, seeing that um, Brazil, I know a lot of traffic comes out of Brazil. Um, and Asia has a significant amount as well. And that is a growing market um, and will continue to be so. Um, but, you know, there's also the aspect of how, how do we increase, um, increase more uh, people into the project and, and by doing, you know, more of the people like, uh, like women, uh, people that identify as non, non-binary, um, how do we increase those? And, and if, and if more people come in to the project, uh, how likely is that to increase more visibility and in, yeah, more visibility with them to kind of like, uh, increase our numbers so that we're, not complete dominantly male is is, um, is is the case with most computer or software uh, statistics. I fear, as with some other statistics that we've talked about those absolute numbers don't really explain the why. Yeah. So we basically just get a snapshot of what we do have, but uh, we don't really count the people that have, you know, like tried OpenSUSE and have left because, you know, they didn't feel welcome or something here. Um, and we also don't really, um, you know, catch the reason why they're here. Didn't they, you know, the ones that are not using OpenSUSE, did they simply never hear about OpenSUSE or did they see some reason in OpenSUSE that made them, you know, decide against it? Mm -hmm. And also, and it, I think this is also partly coming back to the very beginning where we were talking about um, the, the visibility uh, aspect has hurt us in this regard. The lack of visibility has made it so that we're, while we do operate like like most community projects off of mainly word of mouth for spreading it, the the lack of word of mouth has allowed us to kind of stagnate in terms of diversity of people coming into the project as a whole. Um, I, I don't know if there's really a straightforward way to fix this, but like maybe a reorganization of how we do advocacy and in as we mentioned at the top of the hour you know block uh, at the last hour the blog posts and stuff like that to help you know increase the overall mind share um, may actually naturally lead us to start seeing some of these other numbers start boosting a little um, but there's also something I you know we've been uh, talking about the survey a lot that um, that I, I I wish I had mentioned earlier uh, was that the actual issuance of the survey did not get as much visibility as the results of it did. So, um, mm. for example, I didn't even know about the survey until it was over. Um, that's that's Same kind here. of, and so that was a that was a problem. That meant that means that we have. We, we lacked some mechanism to make sure that all aspects of the OpenSUSE community were aware that we are trying to solicit community feedback.
Could it be so that one thing that I've been thinking around or um, around about already last week is um, can't we just um, you know think about some mechanism to actually make or announce such a survey from within the OS? Like you know, having some form of desktop notification pop up that says, "Hey, we're running a survey. Do you want to participate?" And you know, people can just click it away if they're not interested. But that at least would make people more aware than just you know the odd social media post that one might miss in you know midst of you know all the political fighting and uh, cat videos and whatnot. <laughs> you know, that's not a bad idea. Cat videos. <laughs> If you had some sort of option to enable like OpenSUSE news in your notifications, I, mean, I don't know how that would work in GNOME, but like in you know in Plasma, it seems like that'd be somewhat easy. It's like an RSS feed, like, like a default but, RSS feed applet or something that kind of gives here's what's new in OpenSUSE or something like that. No, that's a good idea. I, I assume OpenSUSE news actually does have a feed uh, that can be subscribed to. So like making a tiny, relatively generic application that can push notifications in each in plasma and gnome would probably help here uh, there is an uh, RSS oh. feed yes there is the open source news uh, open source uh, welcome the application we pre-install on pretty much every system already has the uh, first headline uh, from rss feed uh, included as as a clickable link I think that the trick is because you close, you know, I don't leave the welcome open after I boot in, but if you have like a little, an applet or something that just kind of hides the notifications, you know, that, that yeah, the yeah. user could easily turn off, that it would just say like the latest news just kind of pop up there in a the notification, you know, next to, you know, I guess just got a telegram from Neil, you know, stuff like that. I think that would be a really great way to, I mean, I don't know how that would, I don't know the best way to implement that, but that does seem like a, a reasonable way to keep keep the community like you know going back to one of the first uh, statements that was made about you know making every help, helping to keep the regular user involved in the open source world you know with the option to turn it off too for those people who are a little bit you know crazy you have to be very very careful how you deal with something like that um, because i think it's a fantastic idea but you need to make it really uh, very public that uh, it's an opt in thing because i suspect a lot of people are switching to Linux because they just don't like the uh, inherent spyware in Windows and Mac and stuff like that. So, I, 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 I think it would have, have to be, be very... opt out, or it would have to be opt out because uh, otherwise wonder... it wouldn't be representative. Well, it, it, I, you could actually, I would say you could literally be on the. In. You could the... do that from the welcome screen. A very simple right. thing on the welcome screen screen that basically says, you know. Auto, maybe you just have the check mark already there, but it's not. It would not be anything spyware. It would not be. Any, there would be no metrics pulled from it. All it would be is, do you want the RSS feed on in your notification? Or do you want? You wouldn't say RSS feed, but would you like a news feed of open SUSE, of uh, what's going on in OpenSUSE in your in your um, notifications? Very simple, very plain. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing creepy. Can we, can it'd be we very simple. Can, can, can I just do that up? in Thunderbird or like Kmail or where, whatever other? RSS you can do that already. That, and I think so, that's already we, configured we, in all of them. But can we do it ourselves as OpenSUSE, basically in the package, yeah. sort of include that uh, by default, that when you open Thunderbird or Kmail or so at least clients? with So at least with Thunderbird and Kmail, I thought we already were doing this um, because we have a branding package that does pre-configure exactly, stuff exactly. for those. So, if it's not I the case, it, that should be fixed. But I th I the think problem it, it is that it would be a lot less intrusive than having like a pop-up. That's what I mean. Well, the problem is that if we don't have something that say shows up in GNOME notifications, and or or in the or in the Plasma, you know, widget thingy in the bottom, I, I don't know how anyone's going to see it. Like I know in my experience, I would never see anything in Thunderbird or Kmail because I don't launch either of them unless I'm going to make a GPG signed email, which I well, hope to God I don't do very often. Why don't we just go for a web push notification from the News OO or some other web page? Well, every, every, modern, every modern browser supports uh, in, in some way or form a web push notification, right? Yeah, but you have to be on the site or load it up or something in order for the push to work. 
you, you have to start your browser. That is all because it's a service worker that works in parallel. So there's no more uh, conditions that needs to be met. Okay, maybe if everybody's always using their browser, which is generally true, that is an option. It's, I, it sounds to be like the, the, the lowest cost option here. Yeah, well, I, all right. I mean, we can, the other thing is that for server side people, we probably want some kind of MoTD thing, but you know, who knows? I mean, so just as a side note, um, if your, your default browser at least would go to search.opensuse.org and there's news there already that goes to that so, so if i can interject another id uh, so so one one thing is this web push thing another thing is um the 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 news and all the media channels we have are quite fragmented we could just say something like uh we could we could just make one like the official thing for those that may doubt that uh, news is not the official thing, I think it, it's quite clear, but some people might not be aware of it. And also we could provide a filter because I suspect that some people opt out from news OO in one way or another because there's no filter. You have one feed and uh, everything is lumped together. We could just have a different field, uh, sorry, a different uh, feed uh, just for the very important stuff. So yeah. Could we do it, um, Sassy? Could we do like a um, category that we could attach to? Um, to the article. Uh, we could, yeah, that would yeah, we that? could uh, quite easily do uh, per category feeds. That's that's possible. It would be just a matter of actually having a tag that, that works with those very important uh, notifications. Hmm. So yeah, so if we have web push, Per category feeds and like underline when possible that this is the official channel for getting news. Uh, it would be quite good. Okay. So we did have an announcement on the OpenSUSE announce list, um, but that was well December twentieth, which is you know like basically when people start going into their um, vacation and holiday season. So if we could, I don't know, announce that a couple of weeks earlier that there will be a survey and then in a second step then announce the survey is now open. Um, that may also be more um, inviting to people. So I think actually watch out for those notifications. Yeah, I think for the survey, as far as the survey is concerned, uh, I do not know what we forgot to do. I think everything was, was done. Perhaps the timing was not ideal, but I think all platforms were covered. We didn't, mess we didn't message it in Discord. Sorry, 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 just, uh, yeah, we're speaking together. Uh, Neil, what did you say, sorry? We didn't have effective messaging of the survey in Discord, Telegram, um, or Matrix, or IRC for that matter. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah you're right, yeah. And so, and that's where yeah. I primarily interface with the OpenSUSE community because I help a lot of people onboard in the OpenSUSE Discord. And so I didn't see the survey until it was mentioned to me very late until uh, after it had closed. Yeah, that's possible because uh, actually, it was mentioned on Discord, but I think uh, maybe uh, it was not repeated or I, I vaguely remember that there was a mention about the survey on Discord. Yeah, because Discord actually um, uh, keeps track of the news OO new posts, and as part of that, it was mentioned. But I, uh, think and I don't subscribe to any of those. Yes, yes. So you're not. Uh, I mean, I, I fully understand that it was not visible enough in that regard. I don't know. Yeah. So if you have a better idea, I'm totally open-minded about how. Could 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 we maybe uh, just an idea? Um, so 
Andres had mentioned like the time frame, and I understand it was the first time we were doing it. Um, but what about an ideal time to actually do the survey? I mean, it's an end of the year survey. Does it actually have to happen within that year? I mean, we don't have any. You know, it's not like uh, elections for the board, right? So, uh, <laughs> so is there a more ideal time that we could look at to actually do the survey? Um, do we do it I think the, the end of the year is not a good time, <laughs> to be honest, because uh, at least probably not just me, but people have other things in their in their mind. Uh, they, I normally am I'm, I'm a little bit more like attentive of what's happening in in. Uh, open to the world but like end of the year between christmas and and different activities i tend to have other things so maybe instead of doing it at the end of the year let's uh, do it like in the middle of summer or some or some other time that it's, it's well uh, when you're on year. vacation that's not ideal either <laughs> yeah yeah, I, know. I, will have, um, I would have another idea. So um, why don't we, um, you know, do it? I don't know, like a month or something before Open Source Conference, because that would yeah. then also give us a venue to present and discuss the, you know, the, the data that's been collected. That's a good idea. That's that's, good idea. That probably makes sense. Although, when is the Open Source Conference? Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that's Mayish or something. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's why I asked the question because I don't know anymore. Well, the last yeah. one was in October, but usually it's I think usually it's around May or June. No, it's is usually it, time it? to go with the leap release. Yeah. Well, I know that I, last year was an exception because it was postponed uh, to do the virtual one, but I think well, usually it was, it was already going to be in September last year because of. Uh, LibreOffice. They were the ones running. Uh, the okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and that's the thought that we were going to do it with them again. Um, okay, so we're doing a fall thing. Well, that that's that. Typically, right? It was in it was in May June time frame um, with recent releases because the releases before used to be, happen in October ish, but um, the. I mean, right now, no one's really going forward with any plan because no one really knows, can we get a physical one? And everyone's kind of holding off Linux Northwest. A lot of them are just kind of like not really sure. Um, so I don't know right now. And actually, I'd like to probably so, kick that off as an idea. So here's, a, here's another potential option we could have a release party a virtual release party thing where we announce the survey as part of it and have people give feedback at that time so something that that i don't I, i've seen other communities do that we haven't done specifically is the idea of celebrating the release separately from celebrating the community uh so at the release time is also the hype beast cycle for uh, for OpenSUSE, so that would be the potentially strongest uh, way to to plug the survey because people will see like, hey, we've we've put out Leap fifteen three, and with this we want to you know we want to learn from you how how we're doing and where we want to go and and that sort of thing, um, and if we put those relatively close to each other, there's a maximal chance of people seeing it. And that's independent of when we do the OpenSUSE conference. I didn't have a response. I think we did have some sort of uh, Q and A asking, you know, how did how did how did the release go for you? Yeah. Um, and I can't remember the the relative timing of that. Um, whether it was close to or um, when we did the the thing with. Uh, Libra, Libra Office, but um, we certainly, we certainly do get that feedback, and I think that timing would be very important. I, you know, I do like the I idea. Like the idea. Uh, uh, the experience that I've had is when when I first came. Somebody's putting their audio through. Oh, uh, not even. It, it, the releases were in October, so fifteen dot or sorry, thirteen dot two came out in October. Um, 
42 also came out, 42.1 came out in October. Uh, I think what flipped to the fall, or sorry, the, the spring was um, 15.0. And so with that, like, we can't really be certain that it's going to happen, you know, like clockwork. So really, I think picking a month, uh, and that also goes to the fact with the conference as well. Um, picking a month might be more optimal. Well, if we were going to pick a month and we we're going to do an end of the year survey, let's assuming we're going to keep calling it the end of the year survey, I would say that the latest month we would want to do it is November. And then we would hold it open until the end of November. And then, and then it can be used to do this sort of thing in January. <laughs> Well, I, I guess one, I wouldn't be so much attached to, to making this maximally regular. I think my primary question is, what do we want to accomplish? Um, and so depending on that, do we want to, you know, do, do we want to use this as a starting point for conversation at the next Open SUSE conference? Do we want this as a starting point for a next planning cycle for LEAP or all of the above and, and much more. And I, I, I think we may be overthinking it. Just pick a good time, run it the next time. I think it was a success or it, it, it is, it's proving that it was a good idea. Um, so let's just run it another time, not too soon, not too late. And, and then see what, what, what makes sense, what we learn, et cetera. Yeah, I absolutely agree with, with what you just said, uh, Gerald. I think um, it it loses some interest if it becomes uh, too regular, too trivial, uh, because we want to observe changes, and changes need time. So just for that reason, it might be easier to to promote and to get traction if it's not too regular. So something like every two years or every three years, something like that. I don't think that's what he was saying. I think he was saying that it, it's less important that the regularity be tied to a specific event uh, or a specific context. Because if we, if we don't have a way to, con to figure out how we can continuously improve, I don't know how we will improve. Uh, and we, don't ha we have even less feedback mechanisms than most other projects do because we've historically shied away from gathering feedback. So the, the fact that we're even doing this at all is fantastic. And I would like for us to keep doing it on, the, on a yearly cadence because I think that is the best cadence in which we can you know, reflect and, and realize and, and move forward. But uh, what is the timing specifically? That, that's the part we have to figure out. But I, I think Gerald wasn't disagreeing that we shouldn't that about the cadence in terms of how often it happens. It's just more of when specifically do we do it is less important from his perspective. Oh, okay, then, my bad if I uh, misunderstood. Yeah. So I like the idea to do it completely. Um, well, I mean, doing it during a month or a month long period we had it open for two weeks is that right yeah it's pretty much um the longer the better um and you know we could do it the entire month of november we could do it ha um starting at november 15th and go to december 15th uh that would probably be also quite good because you know, well there's there's a lot of different news that can happen and um <laughs> yeah yeah that it probably makes sense to do it mid-november through to mid-december for yeah. for all signs kinds of good reason yeah. <laughs> including every four years uh, <laughs> um whatever could you be talking about hmm. <laughs> i have no idea yeah definitely not politics, i'm totally right? confused <laughs> paula what pa that, 
Oh, if many, open, many texts. Call I this board, yeah, text. call up. <laughs> if it's open long enough, I don't think it matters if you do it in December. Um, uh, I think the point that Maurizio was making is that December tends to be a very busy month. Um, uh, ideally, the end of year is a good time so that you can you can sort of collate the results and uh, go into the new year with 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 the benefit of the results. Um, the issue was, I think, it was possibly only open for too short a time. Um, so. Uh, or you leave it open from mid of December to mid of January. So in between Christmas and New Year, mostly the people yeah. cool down a little bit and have time to take care about something like that and send out a reminder each week or every two weeks or something like that. But this is just yeah. another another uh, thought, but also you know, there are a lot of um, you know community podcasts out there, you know, like Destination Linux Network or, or, or um, Jupiter Broadcasting. Maybe even reach out to them, do some kind of like a, a press release packet directly to them as well, saying, "Hey, mm -hmm. could you hit this on uh, on your community news section?" It, it might, might, it wouldn't hurt. But yes, I think that's good. And actually, I think I'm on destination Linux a week from now. <laughs> oh wow! Really? Finally. Um, but may I, may I propose that we change direction a little bit because we just had a survey. We have the results. So I think it's most meaningful for us to actually see what we do with the results. Um, and it, I think that's what Adrian um, tried to or tried to point out is it, it's more meaningful to do another survey if we can show some some change that the previous had. Um, otherwise, you know, <laughs> we, we, we become experts at surveying and what we do want to become is experts at changing based on 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 input absolutely i think it's also very important that when we do the survey that we try and get the get news of the survey out to as large a community as possible not only the open SUSE community because some of the feedback that we would get from other Linux users or non-Linux users would be uh, potentially very, very valuable to us. Did we have a I don't know what... survey for people who aren't using OpenSUSE and why? I, I don't think it's limited to OpenSUSE users, but I think it's no, no, only no, marketed to OpenSUSE users. I agree with you. I'm asking, did we actually have a path in the survey specifically, like if someone says, I don't use OpenSUSE, to give them a set of questions to answer why they wouldn't? I, I don't do think we did. I, I don't think we did. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, just, I, I'm just putting it out there that potentially when we do a survey, we should hear from all sides, not only our sure. own guide. Sure, absolutely. Because it's only by talking to other users um, or other uh, uh, of, of all operating systems, not only Linux ones, uh, that, that we can understand their concerns and try and address them, win them over. Uh, I mean, it's th there was a, a purpose for the survey, and the survey was was designed to fit that purpose, which was to, uh, to identify and possibly correct issues from people that are used to to use our distro. So you can repurpose the survey, no problem with that. But we are shifting the topic here, I think. Well, I don't. I think that this was, that was always part of what this this conversation was about to begin with, because. The underlying problem that we have discovered is that we haven't, we're not growing in the way we expected. And that, and growth requires bring, uh, outreach to new people. So we can't really, we can't as easily figure that out from ourselves as we could from talking to everyone who won't, who hasn't, who is out there who could potentially become part of the community. So can, can you give an example of a type of question you would you would ask to the to the outsiders to to gather this information? 
Uh, well, if they answered uh, to the question, uh, are you using OpenSUSE, if they answered, I don't, uh, I've never heard of OpenSUSE, then you could ask uh, uh, questions about Linux, uh, about computer things or whatever, what they consider valuable and not valuable for those sorts of things. Or if you're asking, if they ask, if they answer to that question, uh, I no, I use another Linux distribution. You can ask questions about what do you like, uh, what distribution do you use, what do you like about it, what don't you like. Again, there's there's a there's a paths that you can take here to try to get useful information about how other people perceive the Linux platform, OpenSUSE, that sort of thing, and that we can use that to figure out where we should move. Possibly, but you have to, to make a clear distinction between someone who knows what they want, who've thoroughly tried an open source distribution and have meant uh, yeah, blockers and have retreated from that, on the one hand, from the guy who just like uh, tried the, the live image, didn't work, uh, switched to something else. And it's, it's, it adds a lot of... Um, you have to add a lot of filters and fail safe so that you can distinguish between these cases. And that's quite some work. And uh, even though, I mean, even if we manage to do that, I'm not sure we can get a superb uh, overview of the situation for, for, for outsiders. I'm not, so, so point is, I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying, um, it has to be useful, and I'm not sure the cost efficient cost efficiency of this move would be easy to achieve. The other um, point is that oh, what are the chances that a survey that doesn't target OpenSUSE users uh, will reach non uh, people that are not using OpenSUSE, right? And uh, even if it does, how how representative would be uh, the answers that these people give? Because uh, I would expect that people answering our survey are people that actually are uh, within our ecosystem or somehow connected to our channels in one way or the other. Uh, and I expect that these people are, most of them, are at least using one of our distributions. Or do we want to go, do we want to go down the path where this is just a different, um... This is just a different uh, survey in itself, and we could go and just target it as Linux. Possibly. I mean, we have we have the tool. Um, you know, uh, I I know that it has not been integrated yet with the uh, OpenSUSE sign-on stuff, but uh, I believe that is the plan, and that means that basically anyone in the community can can really. Um, Make a make a survey, but besides that, um, right? Like, why not target and get a better understanding for the Linux users or non-Linux users? Why aren't you Why aren't you using Linux? You know, or um, why aren't you using OpenSUSE? Why aren't you using? Um, yeah, Deanna, yeah. they can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> The, the biggest question to ask is what, what, what do you want that would make it make you change? What can OpenSUSE do for you to make you switch to it? That's where you're really going to get to people's pain points. You might open a Pandora's box there, but you know that that's that's a I've always found that a very powerful question. And I think we have enough people here that are interested enough in knowing those things. Um, and we could make it a really a community effort uh, across the across the ecosystem to kind of share those results with everyone. <laughs> if we wanted to do that. I think we do. It's just more of a question of how do we want to position this? How do we want to market it? And how do we how do we make it visible? Um, 
but I, I like a lot of what um, Nate was saying earlier about just making it like once we have such a survey, make a press kit and and push it out there for for um, influencers to to spread the word so that we can get some semi useful data. Hmm. That, that would be a very good thing, actually. It, it was also a point that was uh, raised in the, in the last session. Um, the, the only, uh, my only concern here is that we need to have a kind of uh, a team of, of dedicated people uh, that would do that because you need to build trust and build relationship with influencers and podcasters, etc., so that they invite you, etc., and, and feature you in their thing. And which then brings the question: How do you get these uh, these these very dedicated people? And you know better, uh, Neil, uh, from the Federal probably. Uh, but you guys have quite dedicated teams about that. And I, my my hunch, and maybe tell me if I'm wrong, but my hunch is that you managed to to pull these teams together because you made it you made the the Federal ex community experience great in the sense that many people feel it's fun to be part of the Fedora community. You have video games uh, evenings, you have pizza parties all over the place. And it, I mean, many people, especially the young people, they, they I can't imagine they don't, they don't feel that uh, very fun and, and, and sympathetic and warm environment. And I'm not sure we have the same here. So if that is, if the path to better promotion uh, uh, goes through having people that feel the fun of the community, we might as well start here. Yeah, no, you're right. And and I remember when Fedora wasn't like that. Uh, you know, I, I've been involved in the community for almost 15 years, uh, which I think is how long Fedora's been around. Yeah, almost 15 years. Yeah. And it, it, it only in the last six or seven years has that actually been a thing. And it was a slow going process, but it's paid off a lot. And I think we do, we're in a better place in OpenSUSE wow. now than Fedora was seven years ago. So Are we can say that off. I'm sorry, what? Uh, I, I, I didn't hear if somebody said something, but uh, being able to, um, you know, help people coordinate, have have a place where they feel welcome to to be part of the community, to help advocate, to to have a way to organize and to do from these fun things much, together my, is is helpful and will from, make I think will help make it better. I'm sorry, I think someone was saying something while well, I don't really hear everything. Oh, it was Doug looping my own conversation. Cool. All right. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, th there are lessons to be learned here about how Fedora did it and how we can adapt some of those lessons to what we have. We're slightly better off than Fedora is in the sense that um, we have friendlier active communities in Discord and in Telegram that we can seed from. We just need to start organizing that and turn that into something that is more focused and then support resources from SUSE, from other members of the community to make things like, you know, at those pizza parties and things like that, um, help them become things that help show that OpenSUSE is a fun place to be. I mean, there was recently an effort uh, between Maurizio and Knurft and uh, myself and a few others to have this open Sousa bar thing, which replicates the Fedora social hour. It's That's working. A, <laughs> so it's it's working start, really well. Start. well, we need to start somewhere, but usually right, it's only it's the four start. of us. <laughs> it's, a good start. it's a good start. We just, you know, we could start. We could start broadcasting it and and doing some things to like get people to show up and even get members from other communities. Like, let's get some Fedora people to show up in, in the open Susan bar. Actually, so I, I agree. I agree, Neil. Like, Fedora has a social hour, which I actually participated like uh, yesterday or two days ago. 
And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, the idea works. It's a way for people to just like uh, talk about anything and get to know the, the, the people who are involved in the projects. And it, it, from my understanding, uh, the Fedora social hour is open to anyone, right? Right, that's correct. Yeah. So uh, the same idea, I think the open source bar uh, should, should be the same. Like any bar, you, you just go in and meet people, right? Uh, or, for I mean, example, uh -huh. uh, I suggest uh, something similar to uh, podcast and interview some uh, important uh, users uh, inside uh, OpenSUSE to explain uh, um, why you believe in OpenSUSE, uh, what you, is your uh, um, uh, way to use OpenSUSE and uh, something else. But not formally is uh, something similar. A little conversation with. Can can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can have Doug um, show up in the OpenSUSE bar and just start talking about why he loves, you know, being being an OpenSUSE person. That's well, a start. The, the first requirement is is that he needs to be drinking beer, right? Right. Well, that's right. easy. He lives in Germany. <laughs> Beer's plentiful. Yeah. I have one. It's about ten feet away from me. <laughs> Excellent. My name written all over it. In my book, that's 10 feet too far away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quick well, question, you guys. Um, community. Sorry, quick question. Um, this survey, I'm, I'm wondering about some of the other sort of OpenSUSE national groups. Um, specifically, I'm thinking about OpenSUSE Indonesia. They're very active. They've got a lot of people. And I, I, I wonder how many of them were actually involved in this survey and to what extent we can bring those national groups more into the core because they have very, very lively um, uh, groups in amongst themselves in their own language, which is understandable. But I'm, I'm thinking about the, the demographic of the people here on this, um, on, this, on this particular chat and the one last week. Um, it's... it's 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 not very global. Let's put it that way. Um, and it's very weighted. For example, well, I think a hundred percent of OpenSUSE Hong Kong are here. That's Maurizio and me. <laughs> well then, well, <laughs> no, there is Attila from Indonesia. Okay. I mean, I know that that language, and it was mentioned in the comments here. Um, that language is, is um, sometimes it's a barrier, you know, because you don't, not everyone's comfortable um, presenting or, 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 or watching in English. I mean, granted, all of us have a different accent to our English and um, use different vocabulary for it. So, of course. Uh, yeah. So there is, there is that aspect that is missing. Um, I, I really think leveraging the the Open Source Asia community would be would be great. I mean, there uh, I've been to their their uh, summits they do, and I mean they they do a fantastic job, uh, and they're self organized, and you know um, I'd like to see something like that in North America, South America, 
um, Africa. That's where we could get a lot of movement as well, but um, nothing's nothing's really um, changed there. I, I, this is where I think that if we had like a, a parent advocacy organization, the same way that Fedora has the Mindshare group, we could bring all those those local communities into the advocacy organization and they could actually start helping each other across the across the globe because that's one of the benefits we had from bringing all of the different local advocacy groups in Fedora under the banner of the Mindshare organization. They started sharing with each other how they advocate for Fedora and it has had a positive feedback uh, loop for each of the teams and has had positive impact for Fedora globally. And that's something I think we actually have much stronger global teams than Fedora does. We could leverage that a lot better if we had that kind of a structure um, to support them. Just uh, mm -hmm. context, could you, could you just describe roughly what you have in mind uh, about that? I mean, what, how, how, do you, how do we achieve that? So, um, one of the, uh, as I said a lot earlier in this call, one of the things I have trouble with is coming up with how I would advocate for OpenSUSE as a whole. Um, obviously, people who are strong, enthusiastic user communities, like the, the lovely folks in OpenSUSE Indonesia, they, act, they have really strong talking points and communication styles and things like that they already use to advocate for OpenSUSE that we just don't have rep we don't have that information we don't know how they are able to be so strong and how we could use that to help say bolster the rest of asia to bolster the americas and africa in particular like these are the teams themselves are successful but they're isolated and bringing them into a larger fold where they can share with each other can make it possible for all of the teams to be able to mm -hmm grow and support themselves. All right, I see. Thanks. Um, here's something anecdotal, Neil. Um, the whole conversation about getting those um, those groups involved in, in OpenSUSE, let's call it, for want of a better word, global, very difficult. Um, it also comes from the mindset. Um, I. Uh, was talking to someone in OpenSUSE uh, Indonesia uh, when when uh, we were doing the elections. And um, I said to this guy, um, Are you have you voted? You should vote. And he said, well, actually, I'm not a member. I'm, I'm a member of OpenSUSE ID. <laughs> and I, I, was, I was crestfallen. I really was. Um, there's such a strong community out there, and we don't even know about them. Well, that's the problem I'm talking about. We used to have that problem in Fedora too, you know, six-ish years ago. Um, there, the Russian Fedora community was totally separate from the Fedora one, the main Fedora global organization. The one that ran for Latin, America, the one that ran South America was completely separate. The one for Mexico completely separate. The one for um, Egypt and and uh, and what was it, um, Morocco, they were completely separate. And they were all essentially unaffiliated with Fedora in such a way that they didn't feel that they could participate in the global project and they could help each other be successful. Pulling all of those organizations into the main open source organization while giving them, keeping their autonomy meant that they felt like they were involved and had ownership in open source project as a whole and felt like they could be part of the larger community. That was a very big, important factor uh, that helped make Fedora's Mindshare group much more successful. And I think this is something we need to do in OpenSUSE because we have the same problem, except it's worse. Because there's this two-tier system where there are community members that literally cannot vote because we have this distinction between a community person and a member based on some iffy whatever thing. And that just makes people feel like they have less ownership and less um, of a stake in the project as a whole. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. 
I really it, hear you. Yeah, it's an excellent... The other issue that we have is uh, being able to actually communicate with any of the national organizations. So um, some time ago, I was trying to find somebody uh, who was in OpenSUSE India. Um, try as I may, I couldn't. It was just literally impossible. I mean, I met this person at OpenSUSE Asia, but it was impossible. Uh, and I don't know how we can stitch this together. They, they, um, almost, if we could have some sort of way of saying, well, you can have your autonomy, but let's let's all contribute together in some way, or uh, I don't know how to address it. Well, one of the, it, it's not a, one, so one of the things that Stasi and I, had, or Sasi, I'm going to keep messing that up for a little bit, bear with me. Um, Sasi and I had talked about last year was um, bring up of the noggin, um, uh, uh, login system uh, and account system. One of the things that we would change from how things worked before to how it would work going forward was those groups would get the ability to have memberships declared in there and people who are working in those advocacies and in those teams would actually be able to maintain their memberships with the central OpenSUSE account system. It's not much, but what it means is that we know uh, how they are or where they're involved, and they are much more, e they're easier to reach out to because we know who they are, and they know who they are. Because up until, for example, up until, I don't know, six or seven weeks ago, I didn't even know that there was a there was a sub organization that ran that ran open SUSE events in in the U.S. It's got one or two people, but they exist and they run they run the open SUSE booth at scale. I didn't know that until uh, only a few uh, only a month or two ago. That is appalling. Yeah, we have to start from somewhere though. Like, I, I don't know what else we can uh, what else we can do to solve that problem. Yeah. One thing, we, one, one easy step, one easy step we could we could make uh, towards the, the more local communities is to uh, discipline ourselves so that important stuff gets translated into languages that are not very simple to to move from to English, such as I don't know uh, Spanish, uh, perhaps Russian, Arabic, stuff like that. That would that would be a nice move, I think, to make. I'm sure we're going to make that at some point for the docs because you have no excuse not to do that for the docs. But we could uh, make this principle apply across the board and use it for important um, posts, news posts, etc. Well, I believe the the new system and all the the stuff for blogs and and things. Saucy made sure that we actually can easily support translated versions. So, yeah, I mean, I agree with that. That's a sentiment I think we should just be do doing no matter what else we do. But I, I think our systems now for how we manage um, news content and things like that should make that considerably easier now. Yeah, and, and not, only, not only allow people to do this, but to, like, make the first move, gather with translators and and. Yeah, really enforce this this policy. It, it yeah. is something is very important is published just in case it is translated too. Yeah, and but are uh, you talking about only announcements like you know one time information, so or are you talking also about like you know wiki contents and how tos and stuff? So we start little by little, of course. Otherwise, uh, it's uh, it's uh, bound to fail. So little by little means uh, yeah, uh, release announcement. Um, the page uh, from which you can download the distros, and the main the the, the, the main uh, tutorials and guides we we have in the docs. 
So with the first of those those uh, three, I am first two of those three. I think I'm I'm with you. Um, but what I have seen is, for example, in the wiki, I've seen that like you know translations to what is it uh, the Japanese ja dot jp dot something like that. You know the contents is like so outdated compared to the English one. Absolutely, it doesn't work for wikis. Uh, so yeah, uh, subtract wikis from from my list. Now that we have Pagore, one of the things we probably should start doing is move documentation out of the wiki and into, into the system where we can just regularly generate through CI the docs for all the different languages and give people an easy way to just send pull requests to add translated versions of documentation okay. or even connect to new documentation across the board. That's, that's exactly what's planned ahead for that. Uh, we are currently on GitHub and we will be moving to a um, pager uh, when we are ready. Okay, sounds good. Uh, yeah, we, we, I mean, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but that that's what some people among us believe, and I think uh, the majority will will agree with that. So yeah, we will see. Sure. That. Yeah, uh, you reach out to the heroes team when you're ready to make that move, so that we can make sure you get set up with CI that will auto publish updates to the docs. Right. Thanks. Will do. Well, um, I'm going to have to get going. My battery's about to die here. <laughs> you didn't plug in before you started doing this? I, mean, I, needed two, I, need, I did plug in. I have two computers and one I don't have. <laughs> but, yeah. And they're different. They don't have the same electricity. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting low here. So I'm going to have to um, go. But you can, obviously you can continue. Uh, if you want, and um, I think like closing it out, like I'll write up some another sort of review on this, and um, we start next week on Thursdays. Um, Sasi and uh, I and uh, whoever happens to join wow. will be doing the web development uh, uh, sprints. So. Um, and we can thanks also. For, thanks for uh, putting this together. I mean, everyone who helped running the survey, um, promote the survey, now put the slides together. Um, that's really, really exciting, actually. Quite, quite happy to see that. Yeah, this is awesome. I'm really happy that we're doing this because this kind of stuff can help us become a better better community long mid to long term yep i'd like to echo gerald thanks very much for putting this together well thank you everyone and um enjoy the rest of your day or morning or night and um <laughs> or the bar yeah, yeah and actually, in the bar. let's open the bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Then I can make myself um, lunch while we talk about stuff. Or breakfast, actually. It's still breakfast time. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll, I'll join you in a bit. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, well, yeah, the I, bar is open, as we speak. <laughs> well, I'll see you guys in the bar. I, I have to go. I have to go downstairs and fill up my glass. Yeah, I'm gonna ditch the wine, switch to whiskey. <laughs> what's the link? To, what's the link to the bar? Uh, I posted it earlier. Yeah. Slash bar. Is yeah, exactly. I post it again so that it's uh, visible. Oh, I see. Just slash bar. I got it. Yeah. I'm gonna post it again just so that it's there. Yeah. That was, that was too simple. Of course, that's why I didn't get it. it was just t far too simple. Well, yeah, it has to be long and complicated and ugly and 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 um, cryptic, right? That's that's the that's the way to go, right? Like yeah. a spec file, exactly. yeah. Oh no, no, like Debian packaging. That's that's <laughs> awful. Yeah. But otherwise, I think we're done with this thing because I, I don't know what else to say with with no Doug here. <laughs> okay, guys. All right. Okay. Thanks, um,